reality, as we saw towards the end of the last week, we saw things start to get shaky. Everybody worries about October. That's when we seem to get bad, shaky stock markets and so forth. President Trump said that the Fed is loco. Uh, and uh, I think you and I agree with that, too. I think we're loco for allowing the Fed to continue. But what do you think about the current economic situation? Uh, how do you read the tea leaves? It was one of our top trends for 2018, uh, market shock. And what we said was the world can't take higher interest rates. This whole thing is a phony bubble that was built up with zero and negative interest rate policy and quantitative easing. They didn't mm -hmm. teach you that stuff in Economics 101 at graduate school. You know, they made this garbage up. All they did was flood the world with cheap money that's driven the equity markets up around the world. So the stronger the dollar gets because interest rates are going up, the weaker all those other currencies go down because they borrowed some $63 trillion just in the emerging markets of cheap dollars. And now their currencies are going down. In 2019, they have to pay back a lot of that debt. And with their currencies declined and the dollar going up, it's going to cost them a lot more. And then there's the oil issue. And we're looking at oil now. You know, Brent crude was hovering around $85 a barrel down a little bit this week. But I mentioned currencies go down. What is oil based in? Petrodollars. So now a country like India, they import 80 percent of their energy. Their rupee is at an all time low, keeps hitting new lows against the dollar. So their debt burden on just importing oil is skyrocketing. So, again, it's the Ponzi scheme that's coming to an end. And Trump is right when he says that he doesn't like what the Fed's doing because the cat's in the real estate business. He knows what this does. Oh, yeah. The higher yeah, interest, interest rates. Rate. Yeah. And you're looking at home sales going way down already around mm -hmm. the country. Okay. So they can't take higher rates. Now we're at about 5% 30-year mortgage. So it, it, that's what it's all about. Yeah, I talked about this last week. I said, look at this. You got headlines all over the place. You know, Dallas, uh, Denver, New York. And in Denver, they're saying, well, I think it was an early snow that's taking the market down. It's like, uh, well, it's not an early snow everywhere. And one guy in New York said, uh, whenever I've seen things happen like this, it always goes nationwide. And we've all seen this before. I mean, it's only 10 years ago. N nobody have that long a memory to see this whole thing happening yet again. And we saw when the Fed under Greenspan took interest rates down and left them very low for a long period of time to create a bubble. And then it was a quarter of a percent every quarter that they started taking interest rates up. And then the most amazing thing, Gerald, is the fact that uh, the Fed was out there saying, well, we're not seeing inflation. Uh, that is uh, anything that's really worrying us. But we're going to raise interest rates anyway in spite of <laughs> the housing markets are starting to contract big time. I mean, they're, they're going to burst that bubble that they've created now. Yes. And, and again, you know what this, these interest rates are actually as well, David, they're a war against the savers. Yes. In the old days, people used to put money in the bank and they used to get a thing called interest rates back, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, know. and, you know, when I was a kid, you know, you, you know, Mrs. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Maloney retired in Florida with their savings from the, from the bank, you know, that they put savings away each year. So you don't have that anymore. No, this is just a phony bubble. You know, this number just came out um, on uh, retail spending. Just this moment. Retail sales edged up amid the biggest drop in spending at restaurants and bars in nearly two years ago. In nearly two years. U.S. retail sales barely rose in September as the rebound in motor vehicles purchases was offset by the biggest drop in spending at restaurants and bars in nearly two years, the Commerce Department said Monday, retail sales edged up only 0.1% last month wow. after a similar gain in August. So the it's a bubble. And you mentioned yeah. about Fed not worrying about inflation going up because wages aren't going up. You know, you're looking at wages, real wages right. are, are way off. And yeah. so that's what the, 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 oh, there's something else very important as the America is only concerned with what's going on here. You know, you have an, you have a, you have a stock market crisis going on over there in China. Oh yeah. Just, and their housing market is collapsing there as well. I mean that, the, and they've got people that are taking to the street. Uh, they said in uh, 2016, I got an article right here in front of me, the rise of property prices boosted household wealth in 37 of the biggest cities. It, it increased their uh, total disposable income uh, by 
twice. Uh, so the increase is twice what their disposable income was. So they've seen massive appreciation in their housing, and now that's all disappearing. And they've never seen anything like this happen before in China because they never had any money before. And then they this is their first time they've experienced a giant real estate bubble. And you're looking at the Shanghai index just in a week, just in a week, it's down over 10 percent. And it's already in bear territory before that. Wow. This is real. Just think if the American market was down 30 percent, what yeah. would be going on in this country? That's right. Yeah. And President Trump in the interview that he had yesterday with uh, on 60 Minutes with Leslie Stahl. Uh, they were saying, yeah, they're down 30, 35 percent or something like that. And President Trump said, yeah, they're in Great Depression uh, territory here. You know, it's massive decline. And it's there with the uh, the housing prices already, but the stock market as well in China. So now let's look again. Now let's go at all the emerging market indexes in bear territory. You're looking at crises around the world with these currency crises. What do you have? Interest rates in Argentina at 65 percent. The peso down over 50% against the dollar. I mentioned the rupee. You, or the, you, well, you could go to Indonesia and you got the rupee. Then you could go to Turkey and you got the, the worthless lira down almost 40% on the year. So there's a real crisis going on. The world cannot take higher interest rates, period, paragraph. And what the media says, and they have been saying, and we've been saying it's a lot of baloney. No, the markets aren't moving up and down on fears of trade wars. You're right. looking at right. auto sales in China slumping at record levels the yeah. first time in 30 years. And it has nothing to do with trade wars. The cats don't have any dough. That's right. That's right. They, they will put it on the trade wars. But of course, the trade war has been one sided against us for decades. That's one of the things that President Trump is doing right. But anytime anything happens negatively, economically, they're going to try to attack uh, his trade, his policies to try to equalize tariffs. Uh, and uh, that's what we see with this. But he is absolutely right. It is the Fed. They created the bubble. After they burst the bubble then with their interest rates, they've created another bubble that is even bigger than the one that we had 10 years ago. We'll be right back with Gerald Salenti. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're talking to Gerald Salenti. He publishes Trends Journal. And also you can find it at uh, trendsresearch.com. That's where you can find uh, Trends Journal to subscribe to it. Gerald Salenti is always ahead of the curve, always knows what's coming next. So I wanted to talk to him about the economy. Uh, first of all, what uh, he sees happening the rest of this month, because October, again, is the month that everything gets shaky in the stock market. And we had a pretty shaky couple of days last week. But also the, the trend that has been going on for quite some time, and that is the manipulation of our economy by the feds. And they began even before President Trump uh, was made president right after the election. They started raising the rates to burst the bubble that they had created. Uh, they burst that bubble with uh, that they created with low interest rates 10 years ago. And then they took the interest rates down to just about zero, Gerald, so that the banks could repay all that uh, bailout money. And brag about the fact they'd repaid it with uh, money that they borrowed at 0% interest. I mean, you talk about a shell game. Then they created a, a bubble that's much bigger than the one that we had burst on us about 10 years ago. And now they're up to the same trick again, raising interest rates every quarter. Again, when you even look at the rate raises, there's still nothing. <clears throat> what are we talking about? An overnight, you know, fund rate, what, 2 to 2.25? You know, two mm -hmm. or five. Oh, yes, it, it's low. And when you put real inflation into it, it it's it, they're still very low. And even at these low levels, the world is freaking out because when you look, David, at the facts again, a lot of the Trump tax plan, you're looking at where did that money go? How much stock did Apple buy back already? What, a hundred billion dollars worth? That's right. You said that at the very beginning. You said they're just going to repatriate all that money and buy back their own stock. And that's what they've done now since that uh, tax cut was was put through. Apple's been buying back its own stock. 
As a matter of fact, they're estimating by the end of the year, there's going to be a trillion dollars worth of stock buybacks. Right now, we're well over 800 and, and, and about 50 000, uh, billion. Now, that takes stock off the market when you, when you buy them back. So it's supply and demand that drives the price up artificially. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing is one big Ponzi scheme. And the world cannot take higher interest rates. We're talking about a total global debt. Eh, about $250 trillion. Yeah. Now, remember, a lot of this debt was taken out when interest rates were very low. Now, as I mentioned, global currencies are going down. They need more of their money to pay back that debt. And so do all these mergers and acquisitions that are also at record highs. They have to pay back that debt with higher interest rates. We are in a we are on the on the precipice of an economic 9-11. Yeah, yeah, it looks it looks very grim, uh, very bearish. So uh, what is your prognosis for this? Are you uh, stocking up on gold? What, what is your personal uh, well, position? You know, well, it's GC's three G's, guns, gold, and a getaway plan, <laughs> you know. Bug out bag, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> well, it looks and, like Sears is bugging out after 100, what, 34 years? Uh, yeah. You know, they, they're closing stores, file, filing for Chapter 11. So uh, the unthinkable so, can happen. There is no institution that is going to go forever, and that includes governments and empires just like Sears, right? Yeah, and again, you know, back in the late, I think it was about 1998, we did a story in the Trends Journal about dying brands and how in the new millennium these brands would fade out. And Sears, Campbell's, J.C. Penney's are among the ones we, we identified. Going back to, to doing what we don't give financial advice, I have been forecasting now for the better part of a year that the bottom of gold was $1,200. It's in, it's in our broadcast, in our Trends Journal, Trend Alerts. We said this is where the bottom is going to be. And we think well, gold now is in the is in the uh, one thousand two hundred and twenty range now. Uh, we think gold is at the bottom, and it's the ultimate safe haven asset. Again, it's very hard to say what will go on in the equity markets because they're rigged. They have yeah. a thing, as you well know, what is it called? The plunge protection team. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. The markets is, are as rigged as the uh, interest rates. I mean, they're not yeah. as explicit about it. Uh, they just don't come out and make a pronouncement. It's like, okay, we're going to take the market up by X amount of, you know, like they do with the interest rates, but it's just as rigged. And and who's rigging it? It's the same banksters. It's the Federal Reserve. They have their own trading desk. So mm -hmm. they got all the dough they want. So the markets go down and you think you're in shock territory and bam, they pull it out and it works. It works. Short term, it works. I mean, the 1987 crisis would have been much worse if Greenspan didn't put the, the plunge protection team in. Not that it's right, because it's gambling and we're rigging the game so we don't lose, but you will. But that's what could happen. So it's very difficult to say that the markets are going to crash. Because again, it, the country has been stolen from us by a bunch of banksters called the Federal Reserve. That that's right. Very few people understand that they just created this mob. Why was it 1913? And since that time, our dollar is worth what about 97 percent less than it used to be. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I, you know, President Trump is right. This whole thing with the Federal Reserve is crazy, but the Fed is not crazy. The Fed is Machiavellian. The Fed is doing exactly what they want to do. We're the ones who are crazy for letting this stuff go on as it has now for about 105 years or something like that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about oil and your favorite uh, person, the clown prince, as you call him, uh, <laughs> Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, a lot of things. We, we are joined at the hip, of course. Uh, after we got off the gold standard, we've been joined at the hip with the Saudis, with the petrodollar. And now I find it kind of interesting, and I think there's maybe something more than just the death of one journalist. Uh, certainly, as Stalin said, you know, the death of one individual, especially uh, if it was recorded or whatever, is, is a big issue. But I think there's something else going on that you've got all these neocons, both Republicans and Democrats, now ready to throw them under the bus because, you know, everything was just fine before this happened. Uh, now they've noticed <laughs> what this guy is all about. What do you make of this situation in Saudi Arabia? Well, you know, I, I find it quite, again, you know, one guy gets killed, but... How many people did the Saudis 
slaughter in Yemen over the last three years. Yeah, 13,000. Know, you ask, yeah, <laughs> and, and what is it, the worst, the worst humanitarian crisis in the world, according to the United Nations? And you right. ask the average person about what's going on in Yemen, and they'll say, what's a Yemen? Yeah. You know, they, they don't they even think know. it's a foreign they, currency. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. They don't know. You know, well, there's something out of Disney World, you know. Yeah. And but but the murder going on there and the atrocities that the Saudis have committed, along with the United States, by the way, of forming yeah. all of these terrorist organizations to overthrow the governments of Libya and Syria. None of that is news. But one yeah. guy, you know, a journalist, you know, allegedly gets killed. And as a matter of fact, right here in the toilet paper record, <laughs> front page story. Look at all that coverage. Yeah, exactly. Not a word, not a word about Yemen. And, and, and just this last week on Thursday, we had Facebook shoot 800 alternative media sites in the head. And there was no coverage of that. They just talk about this one guy in, in Saudi Arabia. So they're not really concerned about freedom of the press or protecting journalism or free speech. But let's talk a little bit. We've only got about two minutes left, Gerald. Let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, what you see happening because uh, this, this fracturing situation with uh, Saudi Arabia, or maybe it's just going to be uh, them taking out this particular uh, clown prince. Uh, what do you think is going to happen with that with the price of oil? Well, again, with the price of oil, there are two factors, major ones. You're looking at a global slowdown. The facts are in the numbers. So supply and demand may not be out of hand with the, with the sanctions that are going on against uh, Iran that will take place November 5th. However, if war breaks out and spreads beyond Syria and goes into Iran and the Middle East erupts, you're going to look at oil over $100 a barrel, kiss the markets, and kiss the global economy goodbye. This thing will crash, we believe, instantly if oil hits $100 a barrel or above. And the destabilization in the Middle East is a good signal that may happen. And so the thing to watch is Iran. And maybe that's why you've got some of these uh, globalists that have... Uh basically had enough with uh, Mohammed bin Salman because he was hell-bent on getting into Iran uh, as much as anybody, perhaps even more so than Israel. He wanted to get into, uh, uh, start a war with Iran. And if that were to happen, you and I have already seen how that happens, uh, how that movie plays out when we saw the uh, OPEC flex its muscle the first time and created stagflation for us in the 1970s. Uh, this would be even bigger than that. This will be bigger than that because, again, the debt load. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Gerald Salenti. And again, you can find Trends Journal at trendsresearch.com. You can find Gerald Salenti on Twitter at Gerald Salenti. Thank you so much, Gerald. Always interesting to have you on. Uh, always great insights. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We've got a statement now with regard to PayPal and reports that it has ended its relationship with InfoWars. PayPal joining the slew of tech companies that have severed ties with conspiracy theorist Alex Jones, hitting his InfoWars where it hurts by no longer allowing the site to use the payment processor. PayPal is the latest company to sever ties with Jones after YouTube, Apple, Spotify, Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. Last month, the website called Right Wing Watch posted a report highlighting PayPal's continued business business relationship with InfoWars, and the Washington Post also noted how business on the InfoWars stores was booming. PayPal is the latest big tech company to cut ties with far-right conspiracy website InfoWars, dealing a blow to one of founder Alex Jones's revenue sources. This is, of course, uh, coming at a time when many, at least reports out there, of possible censorship of conservative voices and other people in the media has come to light as well, so Contessa is certainly a story that we're following very closely. It actually fuels the Trump base because they do feel like they're being silenced. And we're also standing up to social media censorship. That's the new thing. Apple, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter have all booted Jones off their platforms. PayPal on Thursday night informed InfoWars, which runs an online storefront that sells survival gear and herbal supplements, that it has 10 business days to find a new payment processor. You can't pick one person and say, well, we don't like what he's been saying. He's out. We have literally thousands and thousands of complaints coming in. 
and you just can't do that. Jones hit back on his website saying the InfoWarsStore.com site had no political content and the move emphasizes how the decision was a broader attack on the InfoWars platform. A PayPal spokesperson says, quote, we undertook an extensive review of the InfoWars sites and found instances that promoted hate, hate speech, hate speech, hate speech, hate speech, hate speech and bullying policies. You're listening to Real News with David Knight. In a world of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And now, your host, David Knight. Welcome back. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to take a look at 60 Minutes attacking President Trump. But of course, it stalled with Leslie Stalls. <laughs> uh, Trump was masterful in this interview. And I've got five or six clips that you really have to hear. So we're going to play those clips uh, from the 60 Minutes interview uh, with President Trump coming up. We've also got some gold coming out of Hillary Clinton. Uh, gold for Republicans, that is. Because the more Hillary Clinton talks the more the Democrats go down in the polls. And you will see why when you, <laughs> when you hear the Wicked Witch of the East and what her latest pronouncements are. Before we do, in this short segment here at the top of the hour, I'll talk about a strange story that I saw on Zero Hedge from uh, uh, Mac Slavo. Uh, FBI steals a treasure hunter's Civil War gold worth up to $250 million. As a couple of guys, a father-son team, Dennis and Kim Parada, they spent years looking for what people have been looking for since the 1863 Battle of Gettysburg. There was a lot of gold that was lost as uh, they were moving the armies around there. And they believed that they found it. They spent five years digging in a cave that was on government-owned property. And they believed that they found it. They spent uh, five years digging in the cave. They spent two more years drilling on top of the cave. And then they went to the FBI and they said, look, we found something here. They presented the evidence to them last March. They felt certain that they'd found the stash of gold that'd be worth about $250 million. And uh, so they showed that to the FBI. The FBI seemed to believe it because the FBI sent out, hired a, a contracting firm to do an underground scan using a device called a gravimeter. It identified a large metallic mass that had the same density as gold, according to the Paradas, and according to an author and journalist who had been working with them. Because typically when somebody is doing a big search for a sunken treasure or some gold stash, they'll usually also uh, work with somebody to document it into a treasure uh, discovery story. Uh, so they're working with an author. And so the author and these uh, two individuals had been working on it said the FBI allowed them to observe the excavation. So basically they discovered it and they were entitled to it. And the FBI then told them after they said, you can watch us dig it out. They then sent them to their cars <laughs> and confined them to their cars. Uh, and they started doing the excavation. And then they, when they finished with the excavation, they come and get the, treasure hunters who had found this, uh, they come and tell, all right, we're finished. You can come see it. And it's just an empty hole and there's nothing there. And again, I'll remind you, they went in with an outside contractor. They used a device to uh, identify that they had a large metallic stash that had the same density as gold. But now there's nothing there but an empty hole. So what did the FBI do? I mean, the FBI wouldn't lie to anybody, would they? <laughs> It's just like Kelly's Heroes or something, like some uh, some big heist film. So they just took the gold or whatever was there and left. That's the FBI for you today. So it, it's not just the Russian investigation. Uh, there are a lot of credibility problems with the FBI. And they go all the way back to even before the FBI was created. J. Edgar Hoover and the then Attorney General Palmer, the Palmer Raids. Go back and read your history and see how J. Edgar Hoover created this vast bureaucracy. Yes, it is the federal bureaucracy, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> the federal bureaucracy of instigation and also of apparently thieves. So they have now filed a FOIA request to try to find out what the FBI 
took out of that empty hole. Again, they had identified a large metal mass where people had identified, they believed that there had been a, a lot of gold that had been abandoned as part of the Battle of Gettysburg. And it had the same density as gold. But now it is just an empty hole after the FBI <laughs> sends them back to the guard. You can't be here while we're digging. And they come back and it's nothing but an empty hole. Isn't that amazing? All right, we're going to be right back. Stay with us. We're going to play for you something else that is equally amazing. As Leslie Stahl was uh, digging for gold, but the person who had all the golden quotes was President Trump. We'll be right back.